This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Hello and welcome to Pop Vouchers, a pop culture podcast by The Straits Times. My name is Jen Lee and today I'm going to give you, you know, a rundown of uh, something that happened in K-pop that's been going on for quite a long time and has been quite a hot topic. So what we are going to talk about today is the whole 50-50 saga. Now, I guess why we are talking about it is because like there's recently a Singaporean link to this whole saga. If you don't know, 50-50 is a K-pop girl group that's very popular. Or rather, a K-pop girl group that had one song that was super viral and made them popular, but um, is not very known otherwise. But um, this group has been in a long, ongoing legal dispute with its agency for a while. And this whole thing has blown up to become like something that's really captured, you know, the public's attention in South Korea and across, I think, uh, K-pop enthusiasts uh, and global K-pop watchers in general. But it has a recent Singapore link because this Singapore-based group called Evergreen Group Holdings announced that it will invest around 10 billion won, which is 10.2 million sing, in K-pop entertainment agency Attract. Now, Attract is the agency that used to own and manage 50-50, but is now in a legal dispute with them. Now, Evergreen Group Holdings is run by uh, David Yong. He's the chief executive. He's Singaporean. He also like made his debut as a K-pop singer in South Korea last year. And he's also like quite closely associated to RBW, uh, Rainbow Bridge Wall, which is the agency that founded Mamamoo, the K-pop group. So he's the one who's like putting money into a track and that, you know, got quite a lot of attention in Korean press as well as I think press overseas like Forbes and so on have reported on it and we have also reported on it. And I also want to explain like why his investment was, you know, met with so much media attention because of the fact that he invested in Attract, the agency that used to own 50-50, and because of the whole 50-50 saga. So let's really just get into it. Okay, so, all right, as I mentioned off the top of my podcast, 50-50 is a girl group with four members. Okay, so Sena is, I think, the leader, and then there's also Aran, Kina and Seo, and that's four group members, okay? They are a quartet. They were actually formed, uh, I believe, in 2021. So I think in 2019, there was already a track CEO, John Hong Jun. So we would hear this name a lot, so just remember it. A track CEO, John Hong Jun. He, I think, came up with an idea with some other company to basically come out with like a, a girl group la, to like form a girl group and that's global you know they will market them globally like they're not just meant to stay in Korea and so on so like you know that's the whole vibe and the whole idea and he started like recruiting trainees basically for this girl group and I believe there were 12 at the beginning and then finally it was reduced to four through you know evaluations and training programs and you know exams or whatever came down to four And after, like, you know, just hardcore training these four girls for two years, the group 50-50 announced that they would be debuting in November 2022. Now, they debut with, like, Loving Me. I think that's uh, their debut song. I think it's a pre-release music video prior to their debut, and that's, like, the first material that they put out. But when they really, really got it, like, made a huge though was not 2022, it was 2023. Now, in February 2023, the group released its first single album. That just means, like, a single. Like, you know, K-pop has a lot of this, like, single album, EP, everything, like, comeback. All these words that, like, don't fully mean what they mean in the English language. But basically, like, you cannot be a single and an album. You get what I mean? But okay, never mind. Anyway, they released their first single album called The Beginning, Cupid, along with the music video for their title track, Cupid. Cupid is what made it super big. Cupid, by the blessing of the algorithm gods, like just became a viral hit on TikTok. Like, I mean like viral in the way that like you genuinely cannot escape it. Like if you scroll through TikTok, you scroll through Instagram reels, you will hear someone use the song. So it goes something like, I'm feeling lonely, 
Oh, I wish I found a lover that could hold me. Now I'm crying in my room, so skeptical. It just goes something like this, okay? And this is the I'm saying the English version, and I think this English version is the one that really, really blew up on TikTok. There is a Korean version featuring all four of the members. They all sing, but I think the one that I think like if you're on TikTok, you'll hear the most is the Cupid Twin version. It's called the twin version because only Aran and Seo sing on it, and it's completely in English. And I think that's the one that really like just went insane, crazy, right? And so like everybody thought, wow, this girl group, this girl group is the next big thing because they have this super huge hit song, and then like you know, like they're 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 just like. People were like getting ready for them to make it like super big, lah. Like, become the next. People thought like, wow, they are really the competition for new jeans to watch because like you know, new jeans is super big, new jeans is huge, new jeans is like oh my oh my god, you know, and like super shy, super shy. There's new jeans, so people thought like this group would be the one to compete with new jeans in the fir- fifth gen war, right? Fifth gen girl group wars, but. No, everything involving 5050 has come to a grinding halt because, and like this is in spite of how popular Cupid is. And to just give you a context of how popular Cupid is, Cupid is, uh, Cupid made history, okay? It made 5050 the fastest K pop artist to ever debut on Billboard's Hot 100, which is the weekly ranking of the most popular songs in the United States. So it's like global, it's not even like Korea, you know? And they apparently now have are the first K-pop girl group to chart a song for 15 weeks. And I believe like, it's still on the charts. And 5050 was also on the top of the Billboard Global, excluding the US chart. Okay, so Billboard has a lot of charts, right? So this one is the one that is like the top songs by excluding the US. And they got like number one on that chart. And I believe like this is this is just like very unprecedented because really the the TikTok vir- the the viralness that it had on TikTok right really just gave this group the sort of momentum that is made of dreams right like can you imagine like debuting and hoping you know oh, I hope we made it I hope we make it I hope people know who we are and like Cupid was out in like February so like less than six months into your debut you are like making chart history that is the stuff made of dreams and some more 5050 is not from a major label it's not from SM it's not from JRP it's not from Hype it's not from YG you know it's from like a small label called Attract and it made it big this is the stuff made of dreams but everything with 5050 really is just it's so sad it's not happening like this group is not progressing because in June, uh, I believe it's June 19, um, 5050, the girl group, filed an injunction to suspend their exclusive contract with their agency, Attract. Now, there's a few reasons like why they are suspending their exclusive contract with Attract. They're saying like, you know, there's a there's a violation of like contractual obligations. They're saying like there's a lack of transparency and financial stuff. They're saying like, you know, they weren't allowed to you know, seek medical help or like take care of themselves well, you know, during their promotions and so on. They also filed for, I think, trademarks of the group name and their stage names. And this whole issue is so dramatic because like the whole injunction was like apparently revealed to the public after a track. So the agency that owns 5050 accused Warner Music Korea and this guy called An Song Yil of like basically trying to push the members away from a track. And of course, like everything everybody knows what Warner Music Korea is, right? It's a big record label. But An, An Song Yil, okay, this is a guy that I need to give a little bit of explanation about. So An Song is basically like a, a veteran, like seasoned music producer. And how he's involved in this story is that because a track is quite small, right? So apparently they worked with An Song Yil as an outside partner. So they basically like outsource some of the work of managing, I think producing 5050's record, right? To An Song Yil. And, and like, okay, what I'm reading is that um, apparently An Song Yil was sort of like kind of involved in this project even before 5050 debut. Like there was always, there were always plans for like a track to work with him. And apparently he was also in charge of like partially like training the girls and choosing like the direction of their music and so on. So like he's, fairly involved but he is not a track right he is not the agency that founded 5050 he is like basically an outside partner he's just somebody that they are working with 
to help produce 50-50. And a track CEO, John Hong Jun, basically accused An Song Yeo of poaching the girls. And he's saying like, An Song Yeo must have told them some stuff, must have promised them some stuff, that he turned them against me. And that's why they are like, you know, barely a year into, maybe less than half a year into their debut, go, like giving up what they have la, with me and doing this. And there are like consequences, right, to 50-50 fouling this injunction. And like people were really shocked, right? Obviously, like people in K-pop were super shocked because as I said, this group was on its way to becoming one of the big name girl groups of fifth gen. Like they had so much momentum going for them. They could have like wrote that momentum, wrote that wave to something like really powerful, you know, and they were like part of the Barbie movie soundtrack. Barbie is like the biggest movie of 2023. And they were part of the soundtrack. They have a song called Barbie Dreams. Can you imagine if like they had, they managed to do like promotions for that? They would be in like North America. They'll be singing. They'll be doing stuff. They'll be dancing. But no, because of this injunction, the filming for the music video of Barbie Dreams was actually cancelled. So even though they were supposed to film a music video for Barbie Dreams, they did not because they filed an injunction. So because now there's legal dispute between them and their agency, this video was never filmed. Barbie Dreams was never filmed. And then it also resulted in, I believe, the cancellation of several uh, contracts, I think like maybe endorsements or advertisements. And they were also supposed to appear at KCON LA 2003 in August. They did not go, you know, they did not go to KCON. Other people went, you know, I believe Taemin was at KCON. He was very hot. But yeah, like, you know, all these things, it just fell through. And it's just like so, like, honestly, like as a, okay, I'll leave my thoughts for later. But like, as a person who like, you know, enjoys k-pop i just find it like oh man this is so it's so bad like you train so hard for two years and then all of these things fall through and now okay because of this um how shocking it was that they tried to end their contract like people started digging into like what's going on you know what exactly is happening and what i'll say is i i can give you like a sort of recap of like what has happened so far but there are the two sides, right, are really accusing each other of a lot of things. And both sides are like insisting that their version is true, lah, okay? So ultimately, and because everything is still quite up in the air, you know, the legal stuff hasn't been fully settled yet. Um, we don't know, like, honestly, we don't know. But what we have is speculation. What we have is like reports from the media and so on and certain things that are confirmed, certain things that are not confirmed. So I would just give you like a brief, like, recap and some of the viewpoints that have popped up, okay? So firstly, as I mentioned, a track CEO, Jung Hong Jun, is alleging that um, An Seung Yeo and Warner Music Korea are trying to poach this group that he founded, right? Are trying to take his achievement of, you know, making this group away by grabbing this group and making it their own. And An Seung Yeo's side is denying this. And then the girls are saying that, you know, the company was not good to them and so on and so forth. Okay, and let me just put it out there. The public opinion, right, on this issue is very, very against the girl group, against 50-50. They are siding with a track CEO, Jung Hong Jun. And look, I've done episodes before on like groups leaving their agency, right? If you don't know, you can go and check out my Can I Tell You Something Crazy episode on TVXQ's Breakup. And in that, I, I said like, I'm very much on the side of labor, you know, I'm very much on the side of like, idols and so on and a lot of the times when idols choose to leave companies it is usually because the companies really did do something that uh you know they felt was not conducive for their growth or was harmful to them or was like not really considerate of them you know and their well-being so genuinely like usually i am on the side of labor but this issue um and the way that it's you know sort of unfolded in the public it is People really, really side with their track CEO. And I'm just going to like, I'm going to like just read a little bit of uh, an article I found at the Korea Herald by Hong Yu called Attempts to Poach Popular K-Pop Artists Not New. Now in this story, I think he lists out sort of what a track is alleging quite clearly. So here it goes. A track is claiming that its subcontracted outsourcing company, The Givers, which is led by producer An Sang-il, 
who took part in producing the hit single Cupid, approached Warner Music Korea to attempt to sell off the girl group, as well as enticing the group to terminate its contract with a track. And it also claims, a track also claims that The Givers, which is, you know, again, the company owned by An Sang Il, secretly took over a larger share of the copyright of the song Cupid by buying the copyright from the three Swedish composers who took part in creating the song. And it's like quite amazing because, you know, like usually this kind of things, sometimes like people don't really take sides that early on. Like, they, you know, they hedge their bets a little bit to see where the wind is blowing. But the Korea Entertainment Producers Association actually publicly sided with a track on this issue in its press statement. It says like, you know, the poaching of talented artists by impure forces based on the power of capital is an act that breaks the foundation of the growth of producers and artists who have created the basis of K-pop. So this is like what they're saying. They're saying like, yeah, like you shouldn't be poaching these people. Like a track should, you know, have the right to, you know, continue promoting 50-50 and so on, right? And like public opinion, right, about this when it all came out was like, as I said, very much in a track's favor because people were looking at 50-50. And the thing is like, okay, let me just try and put this in context a little bit uh, and comparing it with something I I know, which is the TVXQ scandal. The thing is, when TVXQ filed their injunction to end their contracts, to terminate their contracts, right, when three members did so, at that point, TVXQ was already extremely established. Like, at that point, they had already, you know, they had, like, Rising Sun, they had, like, Mirotic, and their debut was also a, quite a hit, right? So, it had, they had, I think they were, like, at that point, maybe four years into their career and at the peak of their careers, they had fans, like people knew who they were, people knew them quite well, you know. But 5050 is a girl group that is so new. They only made their debut in November 2022 and their biggest hit only came out in February 2023. And then in June, which is like three, four months later, they were like, you know, saying like, we don't want to be with this company anymore. And I think this is a big part of it. I think like the public just has not had time to like gain gain trust and affection for the members yet. Like because I think when TVXQ left, right, they already had a very solid fan base that I think developed or, or rather at that point had already developed very strong, you know, attachment and to a certain extent, trust in their idols, right? They they believe that they wouldn't do these things without like valid reason. The 50-50 girls have not established that level of recognition with the public yet. So instead, what the public was saying was like, what the public is still saying is that they feel like these girls are, like they are not grateful and that they're not smart. Because like, can you imagine like you're, you're riding such a high and even if you are treated badly, you're riding such a high, maybe like, Again, I don't know whether they were treated badly, but like I think some people felt like even if you are treated badly, like tahan it, get to a point where you have a bit more power, then leave. And these girls were just not doing that, right? Like they're leaving at a stage in their career where like nobody really knows their names. Like honestly, I've read a lot about fifty fifty. I struggle to remember the names. I had to like go to Wikipedia to find like okay, Aran, Sio, like Sena, Kina. You know, like people don't have a good understanding of them as as individuals yet and also like apparently some news came out that you know the parents of the girls were trying to apply for trademarks for their names and so this was seen as like by the public as like a sort of attempt to basically dump a track the agency that founded them and the agency to help that helped to produce and train the girls behind and like strike out on their own with other people you know and it was seen as like this is really bad like this is like very very ungrateful and in general right it does take uh quite a bit of investment uh to train a girl group as you said like two years you know even if even if the company really like train them on a budget like on a tight budget don't give them good places to stay and so on right even if the company really do that it still takes quite a bit of money to properly train a group, right? You have to give them lessons, you have to hire teachers, and you have to give them space for training. You have to give them space for sleeping, and you have to give them, like, provide food and everything, you know, food and accommodation and everything. So it does take quite a bit of, I would say, cash investment to produce a K-pop girl group. 
and it takes a bit of time for their investment to like to recoup their investment lah. So people are saying like you didn't even like in a way like you didn't even stay long enough with your company to justify the amount of investment they have put in you before you like zao right before you like dump them and leave right. It's not like. TVXQ, where at that point they had been steadily earning a lot of money for SM for like four years, right? And people were saying like, yeah, you know, it's time for them to go is if they don't feel like they're getting what they should be getting, you know? And again, I really don't know how the girls were treated by a track, but there is like, there are like rumors and reports and everything. And one of the reports slash like rumors is that apparently Jong Hong Jun was put in more than enough money in taking care of the girls. Like, apparently, like, okay, that he, you know, let them stay in a very nice place, like a nice high end place. Like, it's not like one of those tiny little dorms where like all four people sleep in one room and it's like, you know, very squeezy and everything. Apparently, he let them stay in a quite a nice, apartment and you know he like treated them quite well la. but again I, I don't know like the, we were not there right with the exact details I'm not sure and since 5050 filed the injunction right things have gotten very very murky so as I said right like a track is alleging that like Warner Music Korea and Ansang Yeo tried to poach the members. So in response, Warner Music Korea actually formally said that like, you know, it's the official overseas distributor, I think, of 5050 and then said like, you know, we're trying to do our best la, to make a 5050 and their agency do well. And it's very regrettable that, you know, a track has cast such like unsavory suspicions on us and that these claims are unfounded and so on, right? So Warner Music is denying that this happened. And then a track also announced that they are filing a criminal complaint against Ang Sang Yu. So not just like a legal dispute between like, you know, companies and everything. It's filing a criminal complaint against Ang Sang Yu, who a track is saying that he like just you know the whole secretly buying the copyright over to Cupid thing is like a malicious behavior and so on. And then the legal representative of the members of Fifty Fifty, so the four girls Sena, Kina, Aransio, their law firm Barun came out and was like, okay, this is why we are filing for an injunction against a track. And so basically the law firm says that, this is a translation from Sumpi, despite their young age, the four members have tried our best to think and behave independently. And after sufficient discussion with their parents, they came to raise the issue with the help of their legal representative. But they're saying that a track is not listening to the members and they have issues with a track that include, you know, fulfilling contractual obligations. They're saying that a track did not fulfill their contractual obligations to them. They're saying that, like, there's non-transparent settlement issues, so financial issues. And they're saying that um, a track is trying to unilaterally attempt to enforce activities on the members despite the members conveying the fact that they have some poor health conditions, right? And so the law firm also said, like, uh, you know, this is an independent decision made by the four members in unison without any intervention of a third party. And then they asked that a track not defame the members of 5050 anymore going forward. So this is like, you know, it's a whole big thing. Like, everybody is like, sort like, honestly, everyone is kind of like slinging mud on each other. And then, you know, that whole thing about how Warner Music Korea denied that it was trying to buy over 50 50, denied that it was trying to poach the members. So, a track released a audio conversation between a Warner Music Korea executive and their CEO, Jong Hong Jun. Okay, so like, apparently, Jong Hong Jun was keeping receipts. And in this audio recording that is from May 9, apparently, and then in it, the Warner Music executive said like, hey, I previously offered An Song Il a 20 billion won buyout. And John Hong is like, I haven't heard of that. He's like, what What are you buying out? And then he's like, well, trying to take over the kids. So the executive director actually said, yeah, we're trying to take over the kids. That's what we talked about. And then John Hong is like, no, 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 you know. So he released that recording. And obviously, like, that made the public even more on the side of a track because it, it seemed like, yeah, you know, Warner Music career is sus like they're trying to take over these girls but again you know um, as someone who's like you know as a journalist you know I'm always like very keen on like you know figuring out all the facts the thing is it is a partial phone conversation and it is released by a track so I don't want to be like oh this 
confirms what we have been feeling or this confirms anything because at the end of the day a track is going to only release things that make them look good you know and yeah like maybe Warner Music career just wasn't keeping receipts or something I don't know but look anyway this whole thing made people on the side of a track even more okay and then more things came out to make people like turn against 50-50 turn against Sang Sang Il and to be on the side of a track because apparently like um the Korean tabloid Dispatch Dispatch is like famous for like you know always revealing like idols dating on the first day of the new year but anyway they're, they're tabloid la. and Dispatch ran a report alleging that An Sung Il had forged the signatures on official documents to transfer the copyrights for Cupid from the original Swedish songwriters to himself. So you know how like a track was saying like, oh, An Sang Yuk secretly transferred the copyrights, you know, secretly like, uh, you know, bought these copyrights from the Swedish cop- uh, Swedish songwriters. So Dispatch is saying essentially that he stole the copyrights for Cupid, which is this huge song, right? And then there were also like more things like there's apparently like a phone conversation that Dispatch released that's between An Sang Il and John Hong Joon of a track that says like that basically gives rise to the implication that An Sang Il hit the fact that he purchased the copyright from John Hong Joon and he actually claims that oh it'll just because like John Hong Joon was calling to be like hey why why aren't there like the producer's names on the credit of Cupid like what's going on. And An Sang Il said like, oh, oh, you know, it just takes time. It'll take a few months for all these things to be credited. So apparently like John Hong was kept in the dark. He didn't know that An Sang Il had secretly transferred the copyrights of Cupid to himself. Okay. And apparently he even did so at the expense of the members because Kina had songwriting. Kina is one of the members on 50-50. Kina had a bit of songwriting on the Cupid track. He had, She had apparently 6.5% of the songwriting distribution. And Dispatch is alleging that when An Sang Hill submitted these documents for the change in distribution of copyrights for Cupid, right, he reduced Kina's songwriting distribution from 6.5% to 0.5%. So it like made it worse, right? So people are saying like, oh my god, these girls are getting like completely cheated by An Sang Il, right? And these things are just like, I'm just touching the surface, okay? Like there's so much stuff. And then things really like got very heated, right? Because there's this SBS. SBS is a Korean broadcasting company. There's an SBS program called 그것이 알고 싶다, which is unanswered questions. And they were like, okay, they were like, we're gonna do an episode about 50-50. And they're like an investigative news program and they're very good at like finding out the truth. So they're very well respected, right? And then when like they said they were going to do a, a, an episode of 50-50, everyone was like, oh my God, we're going to get the dirt. Like everyone was so excited. But then the episode came out and the like program team was blasted. Like they were, they received such backlash because the episode apparently was seen as way too like kind and two buyers for the 50-50 members and An Sang Il. And they're saying, like, you know, you didn't address a lot of issues. Like, you didn't address, like, you know, the trademark, the whole, like, trademark registration stuff. Like, when did they ask for their trademarks of their names and the trademarks of, like, 50-50? And then, um, you know, the controversy over, like, um, An Sang Il falsifying his academic records because apparently he said he graduated from somewhere. And then people are like, online went to dig and were like no you didn't graduate from this you know and so on so they're saying like there's a lot of stuff that wasn't properly explored in the episode and they felt like it was not a good episode it was not a neutral and thoroughly researched episode right and so this program actually had to apologize they were like okay we're sorry for hurting the hearts of so many people who work in the k-pop industry and fans who love k-pop and then Oh, and by the way, like this episode was also criticized by the Korea Management Federation and the Korea Entertainment Producers Association. Like, so even industry people were pissed off at this episode. So the program had to apologize and say, like, we will take this advice very seriously. And then they tried to clarify, like, oh, this, you know, we're not trying to take sides or anything. You know, it's just that these things are like controversial and we were. And they said, like, we are going to, like, fill in the parts that fell short with follow-up broadcasts and additional investigations. So can you imagine, like, the heat on these girls and the heat on An Sang Il is at the point where, like, this program came out and people, like, were excited. People thought this program was going to, like, give them more dirt. And when it didn't, 
like netizens like went up in arms and this program had to apologize. And, you know, the whole response to this really shows you just how much 50-50 does not have the goodwill of the public and their fans, which is very rare, right? Okay, so like we're entering the part of the podcast where I talk about my own thoughts. Because like usually when idols say like they want to leave a company, they want to like break their contract or anything, right? Usually, right, people are quite supportive of the idols. Um, be it like TVXQ, be it like, you know, that time like EXO was involved in all this. People are usually like, yeah, okay, like you should go and do your own things. And honestly, like speaking as someone who like enjoys K-pop and speaking as someone who like follows K-pop news, netizens are not naive to the way that K-pop companies can be. Like, After all the things that have happened, be it TVXQ or be it like Luna, which also had a thing with their agency, like people know that like a lot of the times, agencies don't always treat their talents very well. So in general, the public's perception of like K-pop agencies is really like not great. But in this instance, like almost everyone is on the side of a track because all the things that have come out, and I don't know, like again, I am. I don't know what actually went down. Okay, I'm not saying like I'm not picking a certain side or anything. I'm just saying like the public reaction to all of this, because well, yeah, a lot of news have come out about how like shady, Ansung Il and his ilk are right. Like you know, trying to take over the copyright and so on. And people are really feeling like why shouldn't the attract CEO be allowed to enjoy the fruits of his labor? Right, in the sense of like he put in the effort to like get this group together, you know, he like really like put an effort in training them. He got them opportunities like being on the Barbie soundtrack. And then now he's like getting dumped by the girls and is like so ungrateful of them. So like that's really the narrative that is forming, right? Even though we know a lot of the times that like K-pop agencies may not always treat their idols super well. Again, I'm not saying that Attract CEO didn't treat his idols well. I'm just saying like in general, there is this history, right? It's interesting because I think it shows you like how perceptions can change um, and how like minds can be changed when like certain details of the story are not the same. Because in a way, like, yeah, like a, a group of people alleging that, oh, you know, they never give us the money that we think we deserve. You know, they force us to do schedules that we don't want. These are all things that TVXQ alleged when they were leaving SM, right? But the details are different because, as I mentioned, like, 5050 just did not do this at a time in their career where they can do this, where they have accumulated the public goodwill for this. That's one thing, right? And, like, just nobody knows them well enough to trust them yet, right? To trust that what they're saying is real to build like a sort of relationship, to build honestly a parasocial relationship with them and feel bad for them and everything and all that sort of stuff. So that's one thing. And also I think there is that, there is a little bit of like rhetoric in um, what I'm what I'm seeing of this like, as I mentioned, this whole idea of like, you haven't paid your dues yet. Like, you know, it's not just that we as the public don't know you were enough yet. You haven't paid your dues yet. You haven't put in enough effort for you to do this yet. Like you, it's almost like the whole you haven't, suffered enough yet yeah? again i'm not saying that i know that they suffered or that they didn't suffer um it's just that this idea of like you haven't you just so new eh? you're only six months into your career and then you're like i'm done you're out like i don't want with this company anymore. i want to change like you haven't put in enough effort for us to be like yeah these girls have really really did their best they really do a lot of stuff they tried their best they work so hard and they deserve to be treated properly it's almost like they haven't formed that narrative for themselves yet, right? Because honestly, they haven't had a lot of schedules. Between like like between like November to June to whenever they were filing the lawsuit, the only big hit song they had was Cupid. And aside from that, like people didn't really know them. People didn't really see them around. People didn't see them like working hard or anything. I'm sure they did work hard, but people didn't like see it or register it yet. And I think there is that sort of like rhetoric which it's a bit concerning, you know? I'm not, like, on the side of the girls or on the side of a track, per se. But it's a bit concerning that, that there is a bit of rhetoric of, like, yeah, you need to suffer before you can say that you are worth something, right? I think there is a little bit of that. But I would also say that, yeah, it's, like, really not a smart move. Like, it's just... Uh, it's not a smart move. I don't know why these girls chose this time to do this. Like... You are on such a high, you are on such a roll, and then like you 
really gave it up. And maybe they really were suffering to the point that they felt that they couldn't they couldn't take it anymore and that they needed to get out immediately. And if that's the case, okay, I guess, you know, Bopian, right? But I just feel like, uh, it, I really feel very like, it's such a shame because they were so close to really like, to really a big breakout aside from Cupid. Like, imagine if they got to do that whole Barbie Dreams thing. Imagine if they got to like promote Barbie Dreams on like Jimmy Fallon or something. I mean, come on, like Barbie is the biggest movie of the year, right? Like, imagine if they got to do that. They were so close. And I just feel like you train so hard for two years and then you give it up, you know, at this stage in your career where it's so crucial. And I just felt really bad, you know? And the thing is, I want to keep something, I think I want to tell everybody to keep this in mind, is that the girls are very young, you know? They are like, I think the oldest is like born in 2002, so it's like 21 maybe? So these are young girls. And I think it's possible that they were sort of manipulated into the situation that they were in, you know? There is that a threat. In fact, you know, the CEO is saying that uh, An Sang sort of enticed the girls and, you know, gave them false promises and attracted them to terminate their contracts um, because he wanted to keep them for himself, you know? And I think it is possible. Like, the thing is, ultimately, right, you have to put this in context. It's two, like, middle-aged men and, like, one very big music record label won the music career and like one smaller label but honestly like a bunch of middle-aged men and veterans in the music industry fighting over this like 20 year old girls right and you have to wonder like what's the power differential there what's going on are they pawns for this sort of like power play that's going on and I I want everybody to just keep in mind that yeah these girls are quite young and they are probably not very well versed in how the industry works you know and, they're, and again they're very new to the industry and so, like, I don't want to, like, I know that a lot of people are like, oh, man, these girls are, like, doing so badly for themselves. Like, these girls are so ungrateful. I know there's a lot of rhetoric like that. But at the same time, I want to just, you know, let us keep in mind that it's possible that they were manipulated into this situation, you know? Now, on the girls' side, and I'm not trying to take agency away from them or anything. I'm just saying that there is a possibility, you know, that they were sort of, like, pushed into this situation without really understanding how anything works. But the girls themselves, right, they are saying that, so in the letter that they put out to fans in August, they are saying that, like, you know, there have been a lot of misunderstandings and accusations against us, and we're very shocked by it. We're going through a very tough time, but we believe that there is a truth that needs to be uncovered despite these difficulties. So they are insisting that, you know, they broke off their contract for a track for very legitimate reasons. And they're saying, like, you know, they felt that they wanted to right the wrongs in their relationship with the agency. They wanted to protect their music and they had no other choice other than to quit a track. And they hope that the truth can be uncovered during the legal process, you know. And then on the day that they put out this statement, right, they also filed a criminal complaint with the police against a track CEO, John Hondrun, for fraud and malpractice. So they're really, like, they are not holding it back. They are really, like, this guy did us wrong. That's their take of the situation right which is obviously very very different from the situation from the take that the public has and from the take that Jong Hong Jun is putting out right now I also want to add that the legal process actually has been like progressing right so um, the injunction that 5050 felt to break off the exclusive contract with Jong Hong Jun was actually uh, rejected by the Seoul court so they cannot suspend their like uh, contract with a track which is not the same as TVXQ. Uh, TVXQ was actually given the go-ahead to suspend their contracts with SM. So in this case, 5050 is not given the go-ahead to suspend their contract with SM. Not SM, sorry, with a track. And I guess that that is like the first sign legally that maybe what 5050 is claiming doesn't have a lot of legal, like people are not seeing like a legal justification for it, perhaps. Now, they are going to file an appeal. You know, they have said that they are going to file an appeal and, you know, things are going to continue, right? And in the meantime, you know, a track CEO, as we mentioned at the top of the podcast, has gotten new investment from Evergreen Group Holdings uh, into his company and he is also actually going to start finding a new girl group. He's going to find new recruits and train new people. So that's sort of like a very, very brief, like, rundown of all the stuff that has gone down up to this point. As I mentioned, like, you know, they are really, 
the two sides of this are so set on their version of events and the way that they have been attacking each other has been very, very ugly. And I really don't know who is right. I know that there is a lot of evidence, so-called, um, you know, in favor of the attract CEO, John Hong Jun. But I also want to just, you know, again, point out that the girls are very insistent. They are united, firstly, and insistent in the the their claim that, you know, they were not treated well by their management agency. And I think it is possible that the truth is somewhere in between what these two sides are telling us, right? It is possible that the girls were sort of manipulated into the position they are in. It is possible that perhaps Jong Hun Jun is not as nice as he says he is. You know, he has an agenda and an incentive to be portrayed as nice. You know, he wants the public on his side. And it's possible that maybe he's not as nice as he says he is. It is possible that maybe the girls were, you know, treated in a way that they didn't they didn't like like and they felt was not good for them and their mental health and their well-being and they want to like fight back against that. It is also possible that this is the way that groups are trained and are expected to perform at. You know, it is possible that the standards that John Hundred helped them to or the expectations that John Hundred had of them is just typical of how what K pop agencies usually expect of K pop idols and it is also possible that that expectations and those standards are not healthy. You know, so like, I'm just saying there are a lot of things in this that could have happened. Um, there's definitely very, very sus people here. Like, honestly, I think the whole, like, secretly transferring the copyright thing is super sus behavior on the part of Ang Sang Il. I also think, like, the fact that John Hong Jun was, like, keeping receipts for every single one of, of, of his conversations is, yeah, smart, but also, like, why did he feel the need to do that if he didn't know what was going on? Like, why did he feel the need to why do that? Like, you know, it also tells me, like, okay, this is a guy who's, like, clearly not naive, right? And clearly is very, very, very media savvy. So, like, let's just all, you know, like, put down the pitchforks for a little bit and see what happens as, you know, the news unfolds in the upcoming months and honestly years because this sort of thing takes very long to resolve. And, you know, in the meantime, I'm just like really sad because I thought like 50-50 was a group with a lot of potential and now like, honestly, they're probably not going to work together as a group anymore. Even if they will work together as a group, they cannot use the name 5050. And on, honestly, their name is in the mud now. Like, their reputation is really bad. And uh, just is so, is so, it's such a sad thing for, I think, K pop, you know, not necessarily like for anybody involved specifically, but just like for K pop, I think it's a sad thing that this group was not able to shine. All right, and with that, we have come to the end of today's episode. Uh, I I do apologize if the episode comes off sounding a little bit choppy. I had to stop quite a bit in the episode to like check on dates and everything and check on translations and so on. And I hope I still did an okay job of providing you like the basic rundown of what happened and like my thoughts on why like, you know, it's all getting quite unsavory and a little bit too much. But yeah, like, you know, that's your dose of pop culture for this week. And if you have any ideas on what I should talk about or any feedback from me, you can write in to me at genly at sph.com.sg or you can write into our podcast team at podcast at sph.com.sg or you can slide into my DMs at genlywrites on Instagram. All right, uh, that's all. Thank you for listening. Bye.